Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Haida Gwaii outbreak. 13 local residents test positive for COVID-19. Also. Impossible. It's in, like there's just no way you can have a plan B if you're anticipating that both parents are going to be working. Parents left in a lurch after the province says school might not be back in the fall. And. Uh, we've never seen it this busy. Um, we're setting attendance records almost every day. Summer in COVID times. British Columbians flock to local campgrounds. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Well, they have managed to avoid COVID-19 until now. The remote island of Haida Gwaii now dealing with an outbreak of the virus with 13 local residents testing positive. And our Tina Lovegreen joins us live now with more on that. So Tina, tell us, do you know, do we know how the virus made its way onto the island? No, Leanne, that's still under investigation. Health officials tell us that they're trying to figure out the initial source of transmission, as they call it. But so far, we know that 13 people have tested positive. And out of those 13 people, one person has recovered since. Now, you know, we know that all these cases are linked together and they involve locals. We also know that health officials believe that some of the cases are related to residents who traveled off the island and then the other cases are linked to um, exposure to those known cases. Now, this remote community of Haida Gwaii has been working hard to prevent an outbreak such as this. The island has been off limits to non-residents for some time now. And we've heard from the Haida Nation who've been extremely worried, concerned about limited health resources, saying there is not enough ventilators to deal with an outbreak. But now that they're here, they say it's time to work together. We're obviously, you know, concerned uh, for the health and well-being of all the people of Haida Gwaii. Um, but I think, what, you know, people are... Yeah, worried, but I think really it's a time to be um, be calm and, and to be kind to each other and to support each other. Now, the island has ha been under a state of emergency since March, but just last week it updated that the measures after its first positive case has was confirmed. And there are some very strict measures in place, such as asking residents to not travel off the island unless it's absolutely essential, such as going to the doctors to seek medical attention. And if they come back, if they had gone to uh, traveled outside the island and came back, they must self-isolate for 14 days. So very strict protocols in place to try and contain the outbreak um, now that it's here. Mike, Liam. All right, thank you so much, Tina. Tina Lovegreen reporting live for us tonight. On to the latest numbers elsewhere in the province. Sadly, another person has died due to COVID-19 in our province, and the case number is, and that brings the total to 191. There were also 27 new cases announced, though the number of active cases is back down under 300. Health officials are also identifying a clothing store in Kelowna as another possible exposure risk. Anyone who visited Fossello's on July 18th or 20th during business hours is asked to monitor themselves for symptoms. There are 12 people in hospital, three of whom are in intensive care. 2,934 people have recovered so far from the virus. Well, after months of closed doors, most long-term care homes in B.C. are now once again allowing visitors. But weeks into the reopening plan, some family members are saying the virus, saying the rules are too restrictive. Uh, John Hernandez spoke with one woman who's had to make a very tough decision. My heart breaks thinking about her. The thought of her mom, enough to make Val Utgarin fight back tears. She's in a wheelchair and finds it difficult to get around. So she's been in her room for all this time. She finally got the okay to visit her 84-year-old mother just a few weeks ago. She and her sister would alternate trips to the Nanaimo care home where their mom lives until a few days ago. That's when her mom was told there could only be one primary visitor going forward. She started crying because imagine being asked to choose. Care home residents only get one designated visitor and those visits only last about 20 minutes. There's going to have to be some control because we, every new person who comes in presents a new potential risk and is additional, an additional person we have to do contact tracing with. 
Seniors advocate Isabel McKenzie says the restrictions are necessary. Outbreaks inside care homes, once the front line of the pandemic, have subsided. Most homes in BC have started opening their doors. A majority of people BC, in BC long-term care homes have now received visits and we are delighted by that. But there are still 120 care homes that haven't submitted safety plans. Officials say those homes should open up by the end of July and the limit on visitors could also ease up in the weeks that follow. I, I think and I hope we can go beyond the one, um, but I think it's not going to be six or seven or anybody who wants to come to visit. A minor tweak to the rules that could make a big difference to families. There are a lot of people feeling a lot of pain, but these people in the residence have so little. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the halfway point of summer is near, which means school is just around the corner. Yeah, a full return to classrooms is anticipated, but BC's Premier is warning parents to have what he's calling a plan B just in case. And as CBC's Zara Premji reports that anxiety, that's creating a lot of anxiety, families already caught in the balancing act. Working from home made seemingly a nice and quiet thought. But couple that with prepping food, lesson plans for two kids, and finding time to do everything else life demands, all during the pandemic, and it's not easy. We can't be everything. We can't be their teachers and their friends and their parents through all of this. That should change this fall with a full return to classrooms, but Premier John Horgan says it's best to have a backup plan with the uncertainty of COVID-19. For Ladner businesswoman and mom of two, Natasha Jashani, the thought of no in-class schooling come September is just another COVID-19 curveball. To be honest, most parents were always cognizant of the fact that there would have to be a plan B, but a lot of the reassurance that was coming up was definitely um, hopeful for a lot of us. What are we going to do when it comes to work and making sure that we're also um, providing what we need for our families to, to be economically safe? Which means she'll continue as the educator while parenting, if need be, all while trying to balance a household and a business. She's not alone in feeling overwhelmed either. Impossible. It's in, like There's just no way you can have a plan B if you're anticipating that both parents are going to be working. Um, just the idea of continuing to have children at home and be working full time is just not going to work. Education Minister Rob Fleming says he's hopeful for a return to school on September 8th still, but he'll follow the guidance of science. It's very, very important uh, for the well-being of kids uh, and families to have schools restart in September. Uh, we're only going to do that if it's safe to do so, and, and that is the plan. An update on the new school year is expected next week, and it can't come soon enough. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, and just kind of figuring out what to do with that unknown. An unknown that will continue to linger for now for Deshani's family and others like hers. Zara Premji, CBC News, Ladner. And as the new school year quickly approaches, some kids may need to be tested for COVID-19. In anticipation, BC Children's Hospital has put together a short video to give them an idea of what to expect. I'll need to put this small swab into your nose. Can you see how skinny it is? It's specially designed to check for a virus that might be way at the back of your nose. Now the short video walks through some of the basics of COVID-19 and shows kids what's involved in testing for the virus. From PPE to keeping distracted and how that small swab works, the hope is it can help erase and ease the fear of the unknown. There's only a few seconds, and once that's over, um, generally kids are, are fine. Um, I, I think as anyone who's had it, it's not a pleasant experience, um, but it, uh, for the most part, people do really well with that test. The hospital says for children who are a little more anxious, pair the test with a treat or fun activity afterwards. Testing is recommended for anyone with cold, flu, or COVID-19-like symptoms, even mild ones. Well, travel restrictions from the pandemic is encouraging people to stay local and outdoors when possible. And that is inspiring some folks to dust off the tent or perhaps buy a new one. As Mickey Cowan reports, BC's 2020 camping season is already off to a record-setting start. All right, I think I figured it out. So. Megan Hiller is rediscovering what it's like to set up a tent. And we always used to come to this park, but I haven't been camping probably in like 20 years. 
That didn't stop her from booking a site this year for her family. For her, COVID-19 is a good excuse to get back into the great outdoors, buying all their gear from scratch. Sleeping bags, that sort of thing, toys for the kids, lots of stuff for them to play with. It seems many people are looking to get out and enjoy nature during COVID. The campsites at Golden Ears are fully booked every day this summer. Uh, we've never seen it this busy. Um, we're setting attendance records almost every day. Uh, over 4,700 cars through the gate last Sunday was our busiest day ever. For context, the park can fit about a thousand vehicles, more than four times as many people showed up. These families, happy they booked ahead. Well, this time we had booked right when they had reopened the parks, but it was kind of like a free for all trying to get these two days. <laughs> I was really happy to get like a Thursday, Friday, but that's it. Once you have a site booked, then there's the competition for gear. We tried to get the thermocell. Um, it's like a mosquito repellent dome, but there's actually, it's sold out everywhere. There's not much options this year. For example, we were really looking for bikes and there's not much. I went to Walmart and Canadian Tire and it's pretty much picked over. There were certain things that we couldn't get. So those looking to get into camping might need to get a bit creative with provincial campsites hard to come by. We're going to plan to camp in our backyard for sure. <laughs> Okay, ready? Something Megan Hiller's family might need to consider too. While it's the first time for her little campers, it certainly doesn't look like the last. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Golden Ears Provincial Park. A woman is in hospital tonight after she was pushed and hit by a SkyTrain in New Westminster last night. She's expected to survive, but as Joel Ballard explains, police say the person who pushed her was trying to help. Police say it all began when a fight broke out between two women on the platform of Columbia Skytrain Station last night. The fight turned uh, physical and that's when a, a bystander, a man, stepped in to break up the fight. At that point, the altercation started between the man and one of the women. Police say the man acting in what appears to be self-defense pushed the woman off of himself, at which point she stumbled back and fell onto the train tracks while a Skytrain was slowing down and approaching the station. The female victim, 32 years of age, was initially trapped under the SkyTrain and had to be freed. Once she was freed, she was transported by British Columbia Ambulance Service to hospital. The victim was conscious, talking, and she sustained serious but non-life-threatening injuries. So far, police say there's no evidence to suggest the man intentionally pushed the woman onto the train tracks. He has since been released, uh, police say without any conditions and without making any recommendations for charges against the man. Now, police haven't been able to speak with the second woman who was involved. They're asking that she please come forward to provide any information. They're also asking anyone who was on the platform at the time who might have seen something, who might have recorded something on their cell phone, to please contact New Westminster Police. Joel Ballard, CBC News, New Westminster. A group of Canadian Hong Kong expats rallied outside Oak Ridge Centre this afternoon. They're drawing attention to a new national security law imposed in Hong Kong and its support by the head of a council of Chinese Canadians. Our message is very clear. Like, uh, uh, we want uh, Canadian people can be uh, more aware of like uh, the activities and also the, uh, the uh, the inference from the uh, CCP, Chinese Communist Party. The group says the majority of Hong Kong citizens and Canadian Hong Kongers are strongly opposed to the national security law. Critics of the new law say it will restrict protests and freedom of speech, giving mainland China more power over the former British colony. However, protesters say the chairman of the National Congress of Chinese Canadians has made statements that his organization represents all Chinese Canadians in supporting the new law. Protesters say they strongly condemn that claim. Lawyers for Meng Wanzhou are pushing a new angle to try to free the Huawei CFO from possible extradition to the U.S. Her defense team now claims U.S. President Donald Trump has poisoned the proceedings. And they want the case thrown out for abusive process. In court documents, Meng's lawyers say based on Trump's history of intervening in high-profile criminal cases, he wouldn't hesitate to use her as a bargaining chip in a global trade war. Also referenced is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's comments about the two Michaels being detained in China in apparent retaliation for Meng's arrest. 
The Huawei executive's legal team says the proceedings can no longer be reasonably regarded as fair. Long was arrested in December 2018 at YBR and has been under house arrest in her Vancouver home. A popular backcountry item used to deter bears is being banned from sale or use in Vancouver. City Council has voted to ban bear bangers. The city says there has already been more than 500 complaints related to the loud explosives this year. Violators will now face a fine of $1,000. While the sale of bear bangers is banned in the city, people in Vancouver are still able to purchase them online. Meanwhile, police in northern BC had to issue a ticket to people actually trying to attract bears along the highway with a box of honey nut cereal. A passing motorist saw a person tossing a box of breakfast cereal to a bear along Highway 16 near Kitwanga. Skeena Conservation officers slapped the perpetrator with a $345 ticket. Under the Wildlife Act, it's an offense to feed dangerous wildlife. It creates a serious risk to public safety and, of course, the bear. Although cereal may be part of a complete breakfast for us, it is definitely not recommended for bears. No, not quite. That's just... <laughs> It's an expensive box of cereal. Oh, well, that's just silly. Mm -hmm. 345 bucks. There you go. And the weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how to videos, and more. And meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff now joins us for a first look at the weather. So, Joe, very nice to see you and the, uh, the sunny skies return. Yes, I, the, the sun does help my uh, reappearance into the newscast <laughs> after showers this morning. Uh, but you know what? It was refreshing for a lot of people. I don't think everyone minded a cooler start to the day for a second time in a row, especially because things are really going to heat up in our forecast, already starting to see things uh, change uh, Friday evening. Uh, let me take you to the special weather statement that Environment Canada issued earlier today for basically all of southern British Columbia. For the south coast, with the exception of the west side of the island, we're talking low 30s beginning Sunday. And for the southern interior and Kootenays, high 30s beginning Sunday. And this stretch is expected to last through Monday and I think into Tuesday before we get a bit of a cool down. So really our first big heat of the season uh, and the first time that uh, Environment Canada is sort of giving a heads up that public should pay attention to what kinds of outdoor activities they do. The peak of the heat will be between 1 and 5 p.m. Again, really building on Sunday. That's as we get behind this spinning low pressure system and high pressure builds in behind it. As I mentioned, it was a cooler day today. Why we are uh, just a 20 right now. Let's see if there's any Humidex. Not much, more like a 22 when you factor in a bit of mugginess. And there will be a bit of mugginess to contend with this weekend as well. This high pressure also sticks around for a long time. So uh, we'll talk about what happens after the heat coming up. All right, bring it on. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you again in a bit. Well, this summer, a lot of us seem to have more time on our hands than usual, and that, of course, includes the kids. Thanks to COVID-19, everything from summer camps to family vacations have been cancelled. But four little girls in Surrey are making this one of the best summers ever by starting their own charity. Deb Goble has more. But we have a lot so far. There's more coming. Starting a charity isn't that unheard of, but starting one when you're 10 years old? That is a little unusual. It doesn't matter, like how like old you are, you could do anything you want, anything that's possible to you. That's why these four friends created Kids for Kindness. We thought that, yeah, this, was, this would be good to do, nice to help other kids, and like as we're kids, and like not being on video games, playing like doing all, all that stuff that normally kids would do. And I was like all pumped and ready, I was like, yes, let's do this. This is their virtual toy drive. On the card, go sign your name. For their first project, they wanted to do something for BC Children's Hospital, so they're collecting new toys. They'll even get you a tax receipt. You can buy the toys, and we can come to your door and pick up, pick up the uh, toys or other items safely. They are getting a little help from their moms, a big sister, and her friend. After all, someone has to do the driving, but Kids for Kindness is all their idea. They volunteer before in, in smaller capacities, and so they decided that perhaps, you know, since we're getting older, that we should perhaps do something to give back. It was so super exciting. They, it was, when they found out that doing this, they came to the mommy, we're doing this. I was like, wow, I'm so proud of them. Sometimes you meet someone and you just click. 
Then you find out you all have a lot in common. And we would eat uh, together at lunch and we would talk together at lunch. It's just... Uh, and we would also beg her teacher to put us together in yeah. groups if we're like separated. Yeah, we would up. beg her. That's what happened to these four. When they became friends, uh, I asked them, can I be friends with you guys too? And then we all became friends. Starting a charity was just what they came up with to do together this summer. And while kids, we, we're like free all the time, so we can, uh, so we are better at doing charities and things. We are overwhelmed with the support that they've gotten from the community and the encouragement they're getting from the community. Um, I think this is just the start for them. Because even though they're not even 12 years old yet, they've already figured out something very important. When you're nice to someone, you and then you feel good about yourself. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Surrey. Very important lesson they've learned very young. Yes, philanthropy, starting mm -hmm. very young. I love when she says, and you get a tax receipt, too. <laughs> there you go. Adorable, and they're friends, too. It's great. All right, a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver, also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow both of us and Johanna on Instagram and Twitter as well. Last month, a Toronto pastor told her parishioners she's a trans woman. Now they've spoken out just ahead what the church has now voted to do. Thanks for staying with us through the TV commercial break. Well, the return of the National Hockey League is inching closer and Toronto is gearing up in its role as one of the hub cities. Calder Yuen has a view into the so-called bubble that will contain the league when it all gets going. We're putting Sherm up for the Maple Leafs. That would be scrimmage. Workers busy putting up the fencing around the events plaza this afternoon. Today's the first day. This is right by Hotel X, one of the two hotels NHL players will be staying at. The barriers will allow players to walk from the hotel to nearby recreational facilities without coming in contact with the public. Nearby BMO Field has also been fenced off and will be used as an exercise and activity space for the players. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman says it's been a challenging process. And first and foremost, and you've heard us say that over and over again, health and safety is driving all of our decisions. At downtown's Royal York Hotel, the fencing is also up. One of their great features is a wonderful outdoor patio deck. There's a walking path that will take our players from the Fairmont Royal York to the Scotiabank Arena. There will be 14 restaurants for players and staff within the bubble. There will also be concierge service for them to order delivery. We have faith in our bubble. We have faith in the strength of, of the perimeter of our bubble. NHL's chief medical officer says much thought has been put into creating this bubble and consultations continue with provincial health officials. We've, we've designed it to be constructed in a way that does two things. It protects the public in the first instance, and then it protects the people inside the bubble um, in the second case. And uh, we, we don't expect it to be perfect. Uh, we expect with a number of people that we're going to have some positive tests and we have a method and a process designed in advance to deal with that and we'll continue to consult with the local health authorities um, as that unfolds. And it all begins next week. That report from the CBC's Kelda Ewan in Toronto. A team of European archaeologists has unearthed evidence that humans may have been in the Americas for twice as long as previously thought. The group recovered about 1,900 stone artifacts from a remote cave in the mountains of north-central Mexico. One of the archaeologists calls the discovery a scientific hand grenade. The findings suggest a human presence in the region as far back as 30,000 years ago. Earlier discoveries suggest humans have been in the Americas dating back 15,000 years ago. Wow, so almost double that time frame. Yeah. That's a pretty staggering discovery, that's for sure. Very impressive. Cool. Mm. All right, the week is ending with leaders of two opposition parties calling. Are we keeping going? Are we going? We're, no, we can. Are we, we going? Can, so We're in the middle of our television in, in a couple of seconds, though. <laughs> I know. Is this the actual television read here that I'm looking at, Mike? Okay, I'm going to wait. All right, Facebook friends. We're going to be back in 25 seconds, I'm told. See you soon.
I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. The week is ending with leaders of two opposition parties calling for the Prime Minister and Finance Minister to step aside. As Evan Dyer tells us tonight, it's because of their ties to the WE organization, which the government originally picked to run a nearly billion-dollar grant program. Speaking from his hometown of Regina, Andrew Scheer this morning called on the Liberals to force out the Prime Minister and their Finance Minister, Bill Morneau. So Liberal MPs have a choice to make. Are they prepared to sacrifice their personal integrity to protect their scandal-plagued leader and to cover up corruption? Now, so far we've seen little sign that the Liberal caucus is willing to do that. We do know there's a fair amount of dismay among the caucus about the way the WE affair was handled. Uh, some certainly private uh, criticism about that, but what we've seen in public is cabinet ministers coming out, stating public support for Bill Morneau, saying that they accept his explanation uh, that he wasn't aware that we had covered $41,000 of expenses on these two trips uh, until a couple of days ago, uh, and backing him up as finance minister, and also, of course, expressing their support for the prime minister. Uh, when it comes to the Conservative Party itself, though, pulling the trigger and trying to bring down the government, Andrew Scheer said he doesn't intend to do that and, in fact, might not be able to, uh, and he gave a couple of reasons. Let's watch. There is really no mechanism uh, to, uh, to force an election. The House of Commons will not be sitting again until well into September. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a th theoretical uh, possibility that, uh, uh, that's really not for me uh, to, to comment on, given the, the, the leadership race that we're uh, undergoing ourselves. So Andrew Scheer said that because there's going to be a new Conservative leader by September, he doesn't want to constrain the options of that new leader and how he or she deals with the WE affair by uh, trying to say what will happen when Parliament does resume. But what we do know, of course, is that the Conservative Party and the Bloc Québécois are both calling for the resignation of the Prime Minister. The Liberals in the minority position that they're in need the support of at least one major opposition party to survive a vote of no confidence. And so far, it appears that would be the NDP who have not called for the resignation of the Prime Minister. But the Liberals are in a more difficult position when it comes to committees because of their minority status. What we've seen so far is that while the NDP is not on the same page as the, the Conservatives in the bloc when it comes to resignation, they are very much voting with those two parties when it comes to summoning the Prime Minister to both the Ethics and Finance Committee, although so far he's only agreed to go before the Finance Committee. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. The Privy Council Office is launching an independent investigation into claims of workplace harassment and verbal abuse at Rideau Hall. And Governor General Julie Payette is responding to the allegations for the first time. Ashley Burke, who's part of the CBC News team that broke this story earlier this week, has more. Late Thursday, the Privy Council Office released a statement confirming it will conduct a third-party review of harassment claims at Rideau Hall. In a statement, PCO said it initiated a thorough and independent and impartial review to examine the concerns raised by past and current employees of OSGG. Harassment has no place in the professional workplace. It is a public service priority to advance efforts to more effectively prevent and resolve issues of harassment. Now, this is in response to a story we broke earlier this week. A dozen sources described a toxic environment at Rideau Hall and a culture of fear that includes verbal harassment of employees to the point where some have been reduced to tears or have left the office altogether. Sources say the atmosphere at Rideau Hall right now is heavy and it's tense. The office arranged a virtual meeting with an ombudsman yesterday in light of our story. And Governor General Julie Payette responded for the first time since the claims were published. In a statement, she said, I am deeply concerned with the media reports regarding the office of the Governor General and I am completely committed to ensuring that every employee who works at Rideau Hall enjoys a secure and healthy work environment at all times and under all circumstances. I take harassment and workplace issues very seriously and I'm in full agreement and welcome an independent review, but also note she did not deny the claims in CBC's story. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, last month we told you about the story of a Baptist pastor in Ontario who came out to her congregation as a trans woman. It was an inspirational story that has now taken a turn. The Toronto area congregation has since voted to fire June Joplin. Joplin spoke with CBC's Ali Chiasson about what she's planning on doing next. I'm supposed to be a woman. Hi friends, hi family. My name is Junia. 
You can call me June. I'm a transgender woman and my pronouns are she and her. Joplin was not only telling her truth, she was speaking to her younger, questioning self and those out there like her. Uh, you know, what could I say to that closeted, confused 11-year-old trans girl who is deeply involved in her church that would have made a difference in my life? And that was kind of the, that, that was the frame of reference that I brought into that sermon. At first, it seemed she could continue as lead pastor at Lorne Park Baptist Church. They issued me a new email address that reflected my new name. They updated my bio and my staff photo um, on the church website. But between then and now, the church voted to fire her. They put it this way in a statement. After a month of prayerful discernment and discussions between June and the congregation, it was determined for theological reasons that it was not in God's will that June remain as our pastor. I don't think saying that this is a theological position the church is taking um, really tells the whole story. 111 people voted, 52% wanted her fired, but Pastor Joplin sees something hopeful in that number. Obviously, I'd, I'd rather be back there with them, but um, I've had a few conversations with people that have gone, well, in 2010, that vote would have been 80-20 to fire you. And you know what, in 2030 or 2025, if, if somebody else is on this journey, um, maybe I can have put just another little crack in the, in the ceiling. What's next for Pastor June? Guest preaching on Zoom. Even a congregation that just are, are the folks who are interested in my story or, or, or who want to, to hear part of the message, um, it, it, that can happen. You know, as sad as it is to say goodbye um, to the people I loved at Lorne Park, the next place I say hello to, it's just gonna be June. The work of coming out and transitioning socially won't have to happen in front of their eyes. And so, you know, people won't slip up and call me the wrong name or the wrong pronouns or um, anything like that. And in, in some ways that's a, that feels kind of hopeful and, um, yeah. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, the federal government is hoping a new national contact tracing app now being tested will help keep better track of airline passengers. Coming up, why critics say it's not good enough. Doctors say his survival was a miracle. His rescuers had expected to find a body, not a living, breathing, fully conscious man. But Bob Lord was calm today, even laughing as he talked about his ordeal. I feel great. You know, it's so uh, hard to believe that uh, you know, 36 hours ago I was in, in the ocean floating around. It started Sunday night on a BC ferry when he felt sick near the ship's rail and fell over. The ferry left Swartz Bay near Victoria en route to Tawasin. Bob Lord fell off about halfway across. Pulled along by a strong current, he stayed afloat for eight hours. Finally, an off-duty American policeman fished him out, 30 kilometers away, near Orcas Island. Uh, when the sun was coming up, when I had been in the cold water, I realized how cold it was. I, uh, I knew my hands were numb and, and uh, my feet and my legs were numb, and I started to drift a bit, I guess. Bob Lord says it was luck that saved him, along with a warm patch of water. He had no life jacket. His wife, Linda, says he's a calm man, and that's what pulled him through. She, too, was laughing today. I guess my first thing was, what a turkey, how did you fall over? <laughs> Lord will spend one more night in hospital. He'll be back at work and back on the ferry in a few days' time. Julia Noon, CBC News, Victoria. It wasn't that long ago that B.C. coastal waters teemed with vast schools of rockfish. Divers could film huge reefs of anemones, follow the giant nudibranch, dance with an octopus. 
Andy Lamb has been diving here since 1967. In those years, he's seen much of the rich marine life obliterated. If something isn't done soon, our children and grandchildren won't have the opportunities that I had. I mean, I've seen it and I'm lucky. Canada has many marine parks. That usually means recreation. Not one of them is a wildlife sanctuary the way terrestrial parks are. We haven't got the marine equivalent until today. For today, Whitecliff Park became Canada's first marine sanctuary. Whitecliff Park was actually declared protected in 1973, but without regulations, it meant nothing. Thank you. Today, to celebrate, divers brought up magical creatures to show the kids That's what's great. still down there. They can get quite huge. In other countries, marine sanctuaries have proved to be breeding grounds where marine life can grow fat and sassy safely. Supporters say one in Canada is not enough. You have certain areas set aside where consumptive use of marine resources is not allowed. It's sort of environmental insurance if you screw up in your management elsewhere. At least 15 other countries have marine areas that are protected from pollution and greed. Canada, far behind, has now established one area where marine life is safe. Eve Savory, CBC News, Whitecliff Park, West Vancouver. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. BC health officials say there is a new community outbreak in Haida Gwaii with 13 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Of that number, one person has recovered. All cases are local residents. The initial source of transmission still being investigated. Now, if it ends up being they're not going back full time, then what's the alternative? Are they still having access to learning materials? Parents want clarity from the province over back-to-school plans. Premier John Horgan has asked parents to have a plan B if school doesn't return full-time in the fall. The goal is to have 100% return to classrooms for elementary and middle schools. High schools are still up for discussion. With COVID, we're not traveling like normally we would go to Ontario in the summer, and that's not happening. So this is sort of perfect opportunity. Let's try camping. With the pandemic restricting travel, many BC families are giving camping a go this summer. Officials say popular provincial parks like Golden Ears are setting attendance records nearly every day. Well, camping clearly an easy sell for people looking to get away this summer, but convincing people to fly is proving to be tougher. It's because tracing potential exposure to COVID-19 from flights is still a tricky process. As Jacqueline Hansen reports, Ottawa hopes a new app will help. Slowly, some travelers are returning to Canadian airports, but the threat of COVID-19 remains. In March, the number of flights that carried someone who later tested positive for the virus peaked. But even now, with more screening and far fewer planes in the air, cases are still popping up. Today, the Public Health Agency of Canada said risk of in-flight transmission of COVID-19 on board an aircraft is relatively low. But this infection control epidemiologist wants more data to back that up. We might think that, that airplanes are a little bit less risky than they look, but we're guessing. He also takes issue with how potential exposure is tracked. The federal government posts flights with confirmed cases on its website, but critics say that's not enough. It's nonsense to post things on a website somewhere and expect people to wander over and find that. Some provincial and local health authorities say they also request flight manifest information and try to contact passengers directly. There is some hope that when the national tracing app launches, it may help. I think most passengers would be very happy to provide that data just to be on the safe side. So we're hoping that application will come out uh, as soon as possible. But the NDP health critic says more needs to be done now. Testing and contact tracing are critical to us getting a good handle on the COVID uh, pandemic. And frankly, in the airline industry, it appears that it's not being done at all. He wants the federal government to implement a proactive contact tracing plan for all air passengers. Particularly as we're opening up airlines to fly into other affected areas like the U.S., it's critical that we close this gap right away. For now, travelers who choose to fly should add checking the government's website to their plans. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. 
Well, hockey's coming back very soon without fans, of course, in the stands, but the league is promising an even more intimate experience. What to expect coming up. And it's 6.38 p.m., a live look out towards the North Shore. Turned out to be a pretty decent evening here on the South Coast. And there is some serious heat heading our way. Johanna will tell us how hot it'll get and when next. Today we're going to be uh, harvesting sumac. It's uh, staghorn sumac. It grows along roadsides everywhere, basically. In Ontario, you'll see it a lot along the Highway 400, on the 401. Not that I suggest you harvest uh, your sumac from such a busy highway, but uh, we're going to take some country roads today, some nice gravel roads. I'm Sean Adler, the chef and owner of the Flying Chestnut Kitchen, as well as the chef and owner of Pow Wow Cafe. Sumac, it grows often as an ornamental in uh, people's lawns and often grows in big clusters. You'll recognize it by the typical red cones that grow on the tops of their trees. You find it all over North America and they taste a little bit like lemon. They're tart and they work as a great seasoning for things like hummus. In the Middle East, it's a very popular spice in the spice mixture called za'atar. So this is sumac, you can see uh, the leaves on it are uh, directly across from each other on a long stem. They grow from a single stalk and then have offshoots with a cluster of berries right at the top. They make lovely foliage that turn this bright red and yellow in the fall. And they, they drop these seed sacks as well. So like they're constantly expanding along the roadside. So here's some nice and low, easy picking. You'll find they're a little bit sticky and that's a good sign. So they're furry, they're crunchy little, little berries, and uh, they have a nice tart taste. Apparently this is a, like a, a plant from prehistoric times, I've heard, that's what my mom told me. So here's a really nice uh, sumac. You can just run your hand along it and prick the top off. It's a beautiful color. If you find some that are kind of washed out and pale looking, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for this bright maroon color that really shows that they have a lot of flavor. When they're washed out, if it's been raining, wait a few days and they'll develop that stickiness back, which uh, is where you get all the flavor from. Here's how you make sumac sun tea. The first step is to add some cold water to a large vessel. Add about four handfuls of sumac cones to the water. Sun tea is really add whatever you like and make it your own. But in this uh, version of sumac sun tea, we're adding river mint, a fresh Ontario peach, crushed blueberries, and pitted crushed cherries. Give it a stir, cover it, and leave it to steep in the sun for about three hours. This beverage is great for kids and adults. If you're making the adult version, please feel free. Add some vodka, add some rum, whatever your favorite is, and uh, Pour it over ice, it's delicious. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how to videos, and more. Well, the pandemic has led to an unprecedented drop in human activity. Yeah, so much so that sensors all over the planet show that high-frequency seismic noise caused by human movement by us fell as much as 50%. And Johanna Wagstaff is back again. She's got the details on this new study. So, Joe, boy, we're, we're noisy people, hey? <laughs> 
<laughs> we're no even noisier and more far reaching than we realize. This is a fascinating study. We have these seismometers all around the world to measure earthquakes, but they pick up that daily buzz of human activity. And at the beginning of the pandemic, a geophysicist out of Belgium noticed this drop in his data and open source shared it. Ended up collaborating with over 76 geophysicists around the world to publish this paper today. And I want to take you to this video, this map of these seismic signals using over 600 of these sensors around the world. This is from March to May of this year. So during that peak uh, lockdown around the world time and as you watch along, you'll see those seismic signals dramatically drop uh, as countries went into lockdown mode. Now, I actually spoke to one of those geophysicists, uh, Mika McKinnon, here in Vancouver, who was looking at sensors across Canada. She was part of this study, and she looked at a sensor at Canada Place as well and said it was fascinating to see the drop in first tourists and then regular foot traffic. Basically, all of the data of the pandemic uh, laid out in seismic form. Uh, the numbers were uh, checked with other sources to make sure this is what we were seeing, but the drop was, again, 50% and quite dramatic. As far as what we're gonna do with this data, take a listen to what she says. We're constantly trying to battle through this anthropogenic noise so we can see the things we're actually looking for. We're trying to see the earthquakes. We're trying to see, um, use those earthquakes to understand the deeper structure of the earth and how the plate tectonics are moving. Right now, with all the humans being quieter, we can see very faint earthquakes that normally just get lost. So stay tuned to what this data will tell us about our seismicity off the coast here. We'll now be able to detect much more quieter earthquakes now that we've got that human fingerprint. Uh, speaking of, well, that's a tough connection. Speaking of, off the west coast of uh, Vancouver, where a high pressure is building in. Let's take a look at that satellite and radar uh, the forecast because we do have big changes ahead. I know we're seeing the sun this afternoon, that ridge pushing that low pressure system out of the way. Look at Saturday afternoon, almost the whole province under that ridge, the exception central coastal sections in the north, but you too will clear over the next couple of days. Nothing but sun for the weekend, and it's Sunday that we will get that heat building in. Just wanted to show you some of the other temperatures across the country. Uh, sorry, across the province, really focusing in on the south. Look at Sunday. The heat will be up to the high 30s, and I expect we'll hit some of the 40s for the Okanagan and the Kootenays. And we'll be hot here as well. I put a 27 in for Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. But if you're just away from the water by a couple of blocks and you don't have that breeze, we'll be feeling like the low 30s with a bit of humidity. And I don't really see an end to this ridge for an all of next week. So, yeah, get the hat and the sunscreen and sun sunglasses out. Will do. Not complaining at all. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> And with all that hot weather on the way, there's no time like the present to learn how to protect your garden. So what are the best practices for watering, managing weeds, and controlling pests? Not a good question. So we visited the UBC Botanical Garden to find out. Hi, I'm Egan. Today I'm going to talk about all of the things that you need to think about when you're gardening in the summer. Gardening should be fun, and in the spring, it's easy. You know, the seeds germinate, it's nice and cool out, lush, soft, green growth, but the summer's a whole different ball game. It gets hot, there's water stress, maybe there's bugs eating your plants, and hey, what's that powdery mildew on my leaves? As the season changes from spring to summer, it's important to understand that you're going from cool season to warm season. And there are cool season plants that grow better in the spring, and there are warm season plants that grow better in the summer. Often what will happen is cool season plants will bolt, which means they will flower when it gets hot. That's what they're programmed to do. Be careful if you're fertilizing and watering, because if plants get too lush, they're going to be more susceptible to pest and disease. Not only that, but soft tissues from overfeeding or overwatering will actually be less resilient in the heat, and plants will lose more water requiring more irrigation. Number one question, how do I know how much to water? The only way to know is to check for yourself. So take a tool and dig and look to see how dry the soil is. If you do this regularly, you get in tune with how quickly the soil dries out. And if you do it before you water and after you water, you'll get a good sense for how deep the water that you're putting on the ground is actually penetrating. 
If you water deeply and less often, the surface will dry and roots will go deep looking for water. And what about insect pests? It's important to understand that you need to tolerate a little bit of pest damage. In fact, pests in the garden are good because they actually attract predator insects that you're trying to encourage that keep the pest populations in check. Everybody recognizes a ladybug as a predator insect, but do you know what a ladybug larva looks like? Are you having problems with slugs? One way to trap them is to put boards out in the garden and in the morning flip the boards up and there's your slugs. What's the number one task in the garden? Weeding! Annual weeds like chickweed and peppergrass produce tons of seeds and create a seed bank in the soil that lasts for years. So every time you dig, you expose fresh seeds to light and water and poof, you get weeds growing again. That's why it's important that if you're trying to control the weeds in gardens, you've got to keep the ground covered. So you can use mulches and in between your crops, you can use cover crops. Here we're using buckwheat as a cover crop to suppress the weeds. I never advise using pesticides or herbicides in the garden. Rather than putting a band-aid on the problem and spraying plants with yucky chemicals, figure out what the underlying issue is and learn something. That's what gardening is. For example, powdery mildew spores are everywhere, so you can't eliminate the pathogen. And some plant varieties are more susceptible than others. And it really takes off when the weather is hot and dry in areas where there's not much airflow. So you can pick a resistant variety and find a spot that's going to be less favorable for the disease. So enjoy the bounties of summer and have fun. Remember, the challenges you have with gardening are terrific opportunities to learn. Hockey and basketball are back next week, like baseball though, without fans in the stands. But unlike MLB, there's no travel. All NBA and NHL games are going to be played in fixed locations. Making for some challenging logistics, Jamie Strachan looks at how the NHL sees that working. No more practice. The NHL is ready for the real thing. This is going to be an unusual, to say the least, endeavor. Uh, it will be challenging at times. 24 teams, 12 in Edmonton, 12 in Toronto, will begin arriving this weekend for a three-month stay. Leaving the bubble is, is just not something that we can tolerate. The team's coaches, support staff, and league officials will live and play in these so-called bubbles, physically separated by high fences from the public. Inside, teams competing on the ice will share the same hotels, recreation facilities, and about a dozen restaurants in each bubble. Keeping everyone safe from COVID will not be easy. We don't expect it to be perfect. Uh, we expect with a number of people that we're going to have some positive tests. The league's medical director insists that positive tests will not derail things for the NHL. We still will do contact tracing because there's degrees of exposure. And if we feel a degree of exposure is unusually high, um, they still may be quarantined. If players are uncomfortable competing, they can choose not to play. The one thing we cannot do with players is put masks on them when they play. But we're mitigating that risk by doing testing uh, on a daily basis. In the last three weeks, the league's 800 players have been tested twice a day with only two positive results. The games on the ice, up to three a day in each city, will be the same as ever. No special COVID rules to limit contact. We have no fans here, so we are able to walk around an arena like this and find the perfect, most ideal positions for every single one of our cameras. Fans watching will notice up to a dozen additional cameras. We could bring our fans right inside the game, down low, show the speed, hear the sounds. If the NHL can hold this all together, one team will hoist the Stanley Cup in October. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, fact is meeting fiction on TV's longest running soap opera. We'll show you how Coronation Street is taking on the pandemic next.
Well, a big change is coming to Coronation Street, the world's longest running soap opera. After shutting down because of the pandemic, the cast of Corey is set to return. This time to a fictional world touched by real life. And a spoiler alert, there are going to be clips from tonight's episode in the UK, which won't air here until next month. Renee Filipponi has the details. For fans, so much remains familiar. But now, for the first time, well, with hand been. sanitizer and health signs Walking decorating the, street, the set, the, the reality of COVID has come to fictional Weatherfield. Whoa, 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 keep your distance now. The beloved characters, like everyone else, have been forced to adapt. It's one of the very, very rare occasions where we actually cross over into the reality of the world we live in as opposed to the reality we create in Coronation Street. No. After 60 no. years, it's the oh, longest running soap in the world. But the pandemic yeah. suddenly presents a new challenge. The Queen has visited the set and is believed to tune in herself. The producers say there was pressure to get this right. There is one story which um, focuses around a character of ours that works in a healthcare setting that will be, uh, you know, that will more directly deal with coronavirus and the impact that has on people and on, you know, health workers and, and their families. The need for social distancing is a big concern. Filming resumed in June after being shut down for months. There are strict protocols on set with limited crew and no touching. The staple of a good soap episode is a, is a, is a punch-up or a fight. Can't do that either at the moment. Neither can you. Creative editing and dummies are used to make it work. And romantic moments like weddings are a real challenge. You may now kiss the bride moment. We played that mostly off audience reactions, so, you know, tearful people in the congregation. For safety reasons, actors over 70 aren't returning to set yet. Thanks. But for those who are acting at a distance, leave some second-guessing their instincts. Should I move or should I not move? I and mean, you do feel quite like stationary at the moment because you know that you can't really roam around the set like, like you like you would do as an actor. Yeah, but that's the point. She's always singing about everyone else. Yeah, well, that's a moment, isn't it? For Ryan she Russell's character, the Michael, the, the anxiety of COVID gets real right away. His character's mother is a nurse working on the front line. I'm worried about that. She's working so hard. She's doing so many shifts. And while the pandemic has come to the soap, the classic dramatic storylines stay on course. But now, life on fictional Coronation Street looks a lot more real. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Are you a Corey fan? Um, I, uh, over the years, I wouldn't say I'm a fan, but, mm. uh, you know, I've, I have turned it on a few a few times now and then. But it is interesting because I think more and more shows, are just, they'll be incorporating the, uh, the pandemic uh, into into their storylines. Uh, Biggest story of our lifetime, right? Yeah, as yeah. they come, as they come back. There you go. Yeah. All right. You can always catch this newscast online at cbc.ca/bc. Dan's here at eleven, right after the national. Have a great weekend. Have a good weekend.